Hey, everyone. So two quick things. First, my Facebook group page for The Suzanne Venker Show is back up. I'd been using that page for something else, but I have since moved it back to a private page just for listeners of The Suzanne Banker Show. I want a place where you all can talk with each other and where I can chime in periodically with questions and comments myself. So be aware that if you're itching to talk about the things you're hearing on this program, there is now a place to do that. Just go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Suzanne's group. And if for some reason that doesn't work, just try going to Facebook and typing in the Suzanne Banker show and hopefully it will come right up and then click on join. Okay. Secondly, when was the last time you took a hot second to write a review of this podcast? I get super sad when I check it periodically and no one's written anything in like a week. I just wanted to tell you how much those reviews mean to me and to the algorithms too. Pretty sure the more reviews there are, the more the show will appear in other people's um, feeds and whatnot. So if you think you'll forget, like I know I probably would, keep in mind you can pause this program right now and do it and you won't miss a thing when you come back. We'll still be here in the same spot. That's my favorite thing about podcasts. They're like DVR, which is so awesome. Okay, on with the show. From the magnificent Midwest, it's the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week as we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives about men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. Welcome back, everyone. Today, I'm going to sort of piece by piece dismantle the, let's say, misconceptions feminists uh, tell by using, as an example, a recent debate that I did, a monk debate with a feminist professor whose name is Ellen Lamont. I'm going to play a quick clip from that debate. This is of Ellen, not me, which will be rather obvious in a moment. Here we go. So attitudes have shifted faster than behaviors. Women are unhappy that they have taken on more paid labor, while men, although they have increased their contributions to household labor and child care, aren't doing anywhere close to the amount that women do. And we have a gap between what people want from their relationships and how we structure work and social policy in the United States. So in this manner, desired behaviors aren't supported by um, social institutions. So our workplaces aren't family friendly. We don't support necessary caregiving work through public policy, such as paid parental leave or universal low cost childcare. So this leaves couples managing work family conflict on their own. And they often feel as though they have no choice except for to fall back on a gender division of labor. So this gap between what people want and what they can enact drives stress and strain in marriages. Okay, so that's the that's a portion of her opening argument that I chose because I think it gets to the heart of what her argument basically is, which is that the government, I mean, in effect, what she's saying is that the government can solve marital conflict by enacting social policies that would keep that conflict from occurring. I mean, that's essentially what she's saying. Um, where to begin? I, I know you're probably having a strong reaction to hearing that, but rest assured, I'm going to get to all of this in today's episode. We're going to go piece by piece um, in response to some of the claims that she made, which are downright false and needed more attention than I could give it in the debate. Plus I didn't want to go down a rabbit hole um, with the studies and research because I wanted it to be a really practical and useful debate. And I find that people tune out when they start hearing statistics left and right. So I didn't get into statistics in that debate, which I'm going to do today. And I have all of this stuff for you in the show notes. So one of the things that is very challenging when debating the women in the media, most of whom are feminists, is 
that they throw out statistics that can be true on its face, sometimes are not true, just flat out false, but sometimes it can be true, but it requires considerable nuance to understand the meaning behind it and to flesh it out. And of course, that presents a problem for media because the media runs in sound bites. That's how Americans get their information, essentially, is in sound bites. If um, you're only getting your information from, if you're relying on the media to give to give you the facts, you're getting basically sound bites, and those sound bites are incredibly, um, uh, what's the word, um, misleading, because it doesn't give you the supporting information that you would need to understand the meaning of whatever it was they threw out. Which, by the way, is why YouTube has been so successful because it gives opportunity for long term, long form, sorry, interviews with people so that they can turn off their televisions and get substantive quality information. So that's what we're going to do today is take more of a time, more time to, um, to flesh out some of the things that Miss Lamont claimed that are just factually incorrect uh, and or misleading. I heard from a lot of people, by the way, since the debate, and I'm going to read one from a woman named Mandy who writes, dear Suzanne, love the debate. Ellen never talked about the well-being of children, not once. It's always about the happiness of the adults. I would also be very interested to hear about Sweden's utopia from a person who actually lives there. I'm also curious to hear about the societal and tax costs of a, such a socialistic form of government. No such thing as a free lunch. Also, I don't understand how three months of parental leave is going to impact the child's life for the long run. And I think it's interesting that the people advocating for flexibility are also very black and white when it comes to traditional rural marriage. I am a homeschool mom with two kids, and I also have an online business that allows me to work while still very little while still contributing to our family income and watching and teaching my kids full time. Um, I'm also super doubtful that divorce rates are astronomically higher among traditional rural marriages. Okay, those are all arguments that Ellen made, which if you haven't heard the debate, of course, yet, that's going to throw you a little bit, but that's what's what she's talking about. And I am going to cover that today. Um, I also had another comment on my, one of my Facebook members on my private page for this um, podcast, the Suzanne Venker show. If I, if you haven't heard that before, it's on, just go to Facebook and type in the Suzanne Venker show. We have a private Facebook page where people chat. Um, also pointed out that there are plenty of academic studies that refute many of Ellen's claims, which I, as I said, did not get into, but we're going to do that now. So, um, also one final thing, I will have a link. I will have links, plenty of links actually, to all the studies that I'm going to be talking about in the show notes, along with the debate itself. And you might actually consider pausing this episode right now and clicking on the debate in the show notes, listening to it first, and then coming back to this podcast up to you. It might be helpful um, to have that in your background, you know, in your brain before listening to, to what I'm going to talk about today. Okay. Let's go through Ellen Lamont's claims from that debate. Number one quote, she said at present, 70% of Americans hold egalitarian views so that they, what they want Wait, so that they want men and women to divide paid labor, household labor, and child care relatively equally. That's essentially, FYI, what having an egalitarian marriage means. It's where you are interchangeable with your spouse and you perform the exact same tasks both inside and outside the home. And this is supposed to represent equality. I'm going to get into the nuance and some of the other stuff that she, not the nuance, sorry. I'm going to get into some of the other things she said rel related to that. But before I do that, we're just going to shot down, sh shoot down right away that argument. This is directly from Pew Research. And for those of you who don't know, Pew Research is a nonpartisan um, organization that regularly collects Americans' beliefs and attitudes about major issues. That's, that's what it is. It's the premier source for what Americans want and think Pew research center. 51% believe children are better off with a mom at home. And most Americans 
71% believe that in order to be a good spouse, it is important for men to be able to support a family financially. And only 32% say the same about women. That is in complete contrast to her argument that, quote, at present, 70% of Americans hold egalitarian views. Now, if, and again, this is where it gets misleading. The terminology can be somewhat vague. We're going to get into all of that. For example, when you talk about the word equal, what do you mean? I'm in a, what you'd call a traditional marriage structure or I should say I have a traditional marriage structure on paper, but there's nothing unequal about my marriage. So equal in someone like Ellen Lamont's definition or the average feminist definition, which is why I keep using this word all the time, is interchangeable. That's what equality means to them. To you and me, equality just might mean, I don't even use the word, but Equal might represent more like fair, what feels equitable so that somebody is not, um, you know, overwhelmed more than the other. But that suggests that you then have to get into the details of what the work is that you're doing. So for example, I never compared the, went, went back, you know, back in the day when I was home with little ones, I didn't compare that work with the weight or difficulty of what my husband's work was, his work or tasks were no more or less than mine and vice versa. And that is a completely different view of quote unquote household labor or whatever, this work family structure than a feminist would have, which means essentially that um, you have to be paid equally to be worthy and to have an equal role in your relationship. And I just reject that outright because my view of marriage is very different. They don't really have a view of marriage because they don't really believe in marriage. Let's face it. Um, because marriage isn't about that. It's not about playing tit for tat and having to be interchangeable. So the terminology is vague. And that's one of the things I said in the debate is that you have to be very specific when you're using these words that you're using. Another statement that she made having to do with that egalitarian, you know, 70% of Americans hold egalitarian views. Women's increased earning power actually stabilizes marriage. Women's increased earning power actually stabilizes marriage. That's what she said. That is completely false. In fact, numerous studies have shown that the exact opposite is true. In 2013, the University of Chicago Booth School of Business published a paper that looked at 4,000 married couples and found that once a woman started to earn more than her husband, divorce, divorce rates increased. And what was most surprising is that this data showed that whether the wife earns a little bit more or a lot more doesn't actually make much of a difference. So the researchers concluded that what really matters is the mere fact of a woman earning more. And you all know that I have talked ad nauseum about this subject and will continue to because it's so taboo, but very, very true. Um, and if you get people, you know, privately to, you know, not when they're not in public, they'll admit it privately. Um, they see what happens when women out earn their husbands. So the idea that as she put, she put it, women's increased earning power stabilizes marriage is actually false. But again, look at the terminology, stabilizes. Stabilizes would suggest that it makes marriage more stable, right? More sturdy, but that is not accurate. Okay, number two, Americans who share responsibilities, work at home, are less likely to divorce. Okay, again, terminology. It is certainly true. Americans agree that both husbands and wives should contribute to household chores. That's just basic common sense. But the couples least likely to divorce are those in which the husband has a much larger income than his wife, i.e. traditional gender roles. So the idea that you're less likely to divorce if you have a quote unquote egalitarian marriage where everybody's doing, performing the exact same tasks is absolutely not true. So again, 
this is assuming that a quote unquote traditional marriage arrangement means that you're not sharing household chores. And that is absolutely categorically false. I don't know anybody in a traditional family structure. And I'd like to say traditional family structure because, as opposed to say traditional gender roles, because this, this people have this idea of traditional gender roles as being um, where a man literally does nothing but earn money and a woman literally does nothing except uh, raise children and cook and clean. And I don't, I don't know anybody like that. Women are much, women and men are much more um, flexible and nuanced today, certainly with technology and all the changes that have occurred. And just because you have a traditional family structure doesn't mean there isn't any sharing of chores going on. So that's, again, the terminology matters. You have to get into the specifics of what you're talking about. Number three, she claimed that those who don't share tasks experience the highest levels of conflict. This goes a little bit hand in hand with number two. And that's, again, what do you mean by sharing tasks, right? So um, it is not true that if we're talking about Ellen's argument, her opening argument is that most Americans want men and women to divide paid labor, household labor, and child care relatively equally, then no, it is not true that these folks have lower level, levels of conflict. Conflict. It's the exact opposite. The number one reason marriages are so conflict ridden today is precisely because no one knows what their role is supposed to be anymore. The dynamics around gender roles and responsibilities when both parents work full time outside the home are, I mean, quite frankly, from what I'm seeing as a coach, a shit show. From my end, it's, it's, it couldn't be further from the truth that this is, there, there's some utopia where everybody, um, does the exact same thing and there's no conflict. And the reason for that is that Ellen's argument assumes that men and women, again, are interchangeable, which is why this egalitarian arrangement can never, that's the only way the egalitarian arrangement could work is if women and men were interchangeable because you have to ignore sex differences completely to believe in this concept of an egalitarian relationship. And of course, those of us out in the real world know that um, sex differences are real, that we live with them every day, that they don't have to be a bad thing as long as you're not playing tit for tat and as long as you're understanding and accepting the way men and women think, which is not the same. So for example, we know that men are more linear in their focus. And actually that's, whereas women are more um, multifocused and can do several things at once more easily than men can typically which is not to say that women are superior, by the way, because there is much to be said for men's ability to be completely focused. And I think women could use, you know, um, could be, uh, uh, you know, take a, what am I trying to say? Uh, a, a play from the playbook. What, what am I thinking of? Um, from how men are able to focus. I'd like to be more focused. So this idea that women can do more than one thing that works really well for work and family, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's a win-win. So again, it's how are you looking at the differences and appreciating them and working with them rather than, you know, complaining about them. Men are also needed much more when their children become toddlers and up and older. Um, babies need their mothers more than they need their fathers. I mean, hello, our bodies gave birth to the babies. Our bodies nurse the babies. Obviously there's an attachment there that's different for mom than it is for dad. So dad often feels kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, out of place. I'm not sure what the right word is. Um, not useful right away because the baby's so attached to mom. But as the baby gets older and older and older, then he, be, then he kicks in and he can see once he can interact more um, and, you know, deal with the tumble play and all of that, um, it becomes much more natural for him. So again, a difference that if you are pretending that there is no different, are no differences between women and men, you're not going to be able to um, appreciate that. And that could cause conflict. So I would argue that, the conflict really comes from not understanding one another and those differences, not Ellen's argument, which of course is that it's the state's fault that, um, you know, marital problems 
with work and family exist. Okay, number four, quote, equal sharing of domestic labor equals greater sexual satisfaction, end quote. Bullshit. More sex for married couples with traditional divisions of housework. This is from 2013. Married men and women. Hold on. I want to read this to get this right. Again, this will be in the um, show notes. Married men and women who divide household chores in traditional ways report having more sex than couples who share so-called men's and women's work, according to a new study authored by sociologists at the University of Washington. Other studies found that husbands got more sex if they did more housework, implying that sex was an exchange for housework. But those studies did not factor in what type of chores the husbands were doing. The new study shows that sex isn't a bargaining chip. Instead, it's linked to what types of chores each spouse completes. Couples who follow traditional gender roles around the house, wives doing the cooking, cleaning, and shopping, men doing more yard work, paying bills, and auto maintenance report greater sexual frequency. Quote, the results show that gender still organizes quite a bit of everyday life in marriage. It shows that gender still organizes, did I say that right? Yeah, quite a bit of everyday life in marriage said co-author Julie Brines. In particular, it seems that the gender identities husbands and wives express through the chores they do also help structure sexual behavior. So again, going back to Ellen's comment, equal sharing of domestic labor equals greater sexual satisfaction. Well, what labor? Which labor? And what do you mean by, again, by the sharing of it? Because if a man puts on, the research showed that when a man puts on an apron and starts doing all these quote unquote women's chores, that's not as sexually appealing to a woman as when he is doing more quote unquote manly chores. Again, we don't want to acknowledge this because remember we're supposed to be interchangeable. We're the same. There's no such thing as sex differences. Men don't get turned on by women being women and women don't get turned on by men being men. So therefore um, this is all crap. But of course, once again, if you're out in the real world, you know that that is absolutely um that what I'm saying is absolutely true. So, um, yeah, that was another, another falsification on her part. Number five, she actually said, quote unquote, the neuroscience doesn't say there are major differences between women and men. The neuroscience doesn't say there are major differences between women and men. Now she might be trying to, This would be an example of what I mean again. It is true that there are more similarities in women and men than there are differences, but the differences that are there are very significant. So if you want to mince words and you want to get technical and you want to talk about stats and research, which of course is what, you know, feminist professors love to do again, get specific the neuroscience doesn't say that there are major differences. Actually, it does say that. And tell that to Dr. Luann Brissendine, who wrote The Female Brain and the Male Brain. Tell it to Dr. Stephen Rhodes, who wrote Taking Sex Differences Seriously. There are, there is, there is a boatload of data showing the exact opposite of what her claim is. But again, if you say it in that way and people don't know that, they're going to take you at your word because you're not being honest. You're just it's a soundbite going back to how I started this whole thing. They're just sound bites, and people are, you know, who don't have time or who don't want to dig in deep are going to believe those sound bites, which is what the media, um, depends on. And they're not wrong. They're not wrong. People have absolutely, um, gotten their, their ideas through those sound bites. It's very effective. Okay. So those are the main um, quotes I wanted to debunk, but I'm going to, I'm going to keep going here about some other things that she brought up. Um, one of the things that feminists love to talk about is Sweden and Scandinavian countries. And certainly she brought that up over and over again in the debate. These countries do have the greatest levels of gender equality attitudes. There's no question. Unfortunately, It doesn't translate to behaviors. And in fact, as Jordan Peterson has pointed out repeatedly, if you follow him, the more egalitarian the country, the greater the sex differences show up. And of course, feminists like Miss Lamont 
leave that part out. One study pointed out that a so-called gender equality paradox exists in that there are more women in STEM in countries that have lower gender equality. Women make up 40% of engineering majors in Jordan, for example, but only 34% in Sweden and 19 in the U.S. The researchers suggest that women are just less interested in STEM. Well, duh, we know that. And when liberal Western countries let them choose freely, they freely choose different fields. So that's another, um, again, really when they're talking about the utopia there, there's a huge part that they're not talking about. And we set, we definitely didn't get into it in the debate. And that is that essentially what Ms. Lamont is doing is blaming, and she actually says this in the debate, is she's blaming capitalism for marital conflict. I mean, listen carefully, because that's what she's saying. The state, in other words, is both the problem and the solution. So rather than helping individual couples understand each other better and communicate better, she actually believes that social policy will solve people's marital struggles. And th- and again, pointing out um, how they do things in Sweden is one way of doing that because the gender equality attitudes are so different over there. Um, however... There is a, there's an oversight there that is, that makes the argument incomplete if you don't have this part of the conversation, which they never do. And that is the cost. Um, at one point she did make the claim when she was saying about, um, you know, the way our system is, is the problem you know, marital conflict exists because the state won't provide things like, um, paid maternity and paternity leave and government universal daycare. Those are the basic two things that they argue for thinking this is going to resolve it. She did concede that, um, the more heavily funded something is, the more successful it is. So, but she didn't point that out with Sweden. She didn't say, of course, what we know about Sweden and how it's different from here in the U.S., which is that it has a top statutory personal income tax rate of 52.3%. So this utopia that feminists want is only possible, and I would argue that it still isn't possible, but if you were going to make an argument for it to be possible, it's that you would have to throw capitalism out. Which, as I said, she actually said in the debate that capitalism is the problem. So unless she or any other feminist is going to get most Americans to agree to give up capitalism in favor of socialism, you're never going to reach your utopia anyway. So really, at the end of the day, this is this is a political argument, isn't it? I mean, that's what we're talking about is politics here. But there's not enough attention paid to the political nature of this conversation. It's framed like it's just basic common sense or basic equity, you know, fairness for women and men need to be doing the same thing. And it's just the right thing. And it's fair. And then women in their full potential and men in their, you know, being fathers at home, like mothers and all this stuff sounds good, but in order to um, put it into action, you need a completely different system. And that's where the disconnect is, is that most Americans are not on board with the system that they want to be able to even potentially make this happen. You know, at the end of the day, what feminists want or or what feminists are doing is completely rejecting human nature and spending their entire life fighting against, I mean, I can't even imagine spending my life, you know, fighting against human nature, which is, of course, this is why they're not successfully married with kids themselves because you, you, you couldn't possibly do that and be successful. Um, I mean, you couldn't be successful in that domain and be fighting human nature simultaneously. That's not going to go together. Um, yeah. So that's, that's really what this, this is ultimately about. Now I'm going to read just to give you an example. Um, one of the many, 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 many comments I have heard since, Um, not so much this debate, but since I did that, um, daycare video that someone sent to me and I'll use this as an example of the difference between, um, 
Ellen and myself or any feminist in myself in terms of how they would handle or approach this, this scenario. This is a wife and mother. I don't have her name who wrote, I was bringing in the bigger income with a chaotic schedule and starting a new job when my son was three months old. My husband travels too. So we decided to hire a nanny. The nanny was spending more time with my son than my husband and me. And this was eating away at me emotionally for a, a chronic period of time, but I felt a greater responsibility to my career because of years of conditioning myself. When the nanny quit, my son turned two. I panicked and placed my son in a daycare. He would scream and cry before going every morning for months. It affected my job performance and my mental health. Then one day he developed HM, I think that's hoof, hoof mouth, foot disease, right? I can't remember all those, all those diseases from uh, childhood. And passed it to my husband and me. My hu- my job gave me such a hard time to take the time off necessary to care for my family. That was the nail in the coffin for my job. I realized at that point that I or my husband needed to make a sacrifice. One of us had to quit to, to, quit to care for our son full time or move closer to family so that we could get the support we needed. I ended up quitting and have no regrets. Okay, so that is an example of how a family attempts to do too much, basically, right? It can't be done living that life and peacefully anyway, and realizing that something had to change in order to be happier. And they worked it out. Now, if you go back to where she said, My job gave me such a hard time to take the time off necessary to care for my family. I guarantee you that's that's something Miss Lamont would point to to say that's where the problem was. That somehow if the job had given her the time off necessary to care for her family, well, first of all, how long? What are we talking here? A few months? A few weeks? How can businesses or companies give you endless amounts of time to take care of this, which is what feminists want? There'd be no way to do that unless you were to give full three years to a new mom. And while that sounds lovely for the child's sake, it's not going to work economically because here in the U.S. we do have a capitalistic country. We do not have a socialistic country. And other people do not want to pay for other people to raise their children. That's So you can spend your whole life, if you want, trying to overturn that system, but that's the system that we have. So it isn't realistic. People need answers that they can enact right now and figure things out for themselves when they um, need to, as this family did. And of course, in the end, she says, I have no regrets. I'm happy. I love this. So the suggestion that the alternative would have been better is um, moot because clearly they worked it out. So I'm using that as an example of that's really where the disconnect is between a feminist argument for this scenario versus yours and mine. Um, Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, everything is so, everything is portrayed as being so black and white when discussing this topic on the part of feminists, because they want you to think that you either, and I did say this in the um, debate, I do remember this, that you either believe in equality or that you either believe that when men and women um, can be equal, equally valued, let's say, at home, or you don't, as though the way to prove you are equal is to perform the exact same tasks, both inside and outside the home, that that proves some faux notion of equality, or that you're equal, or that, that your relationship is fair, um, when, of course, It doesn't have to mean that at all, that if you are not performing the same task, that your relationship is not equally balanced. It absolutely can be equally balanced if you're not performing the same tasks. So she will point out and did several times in the debate that you either have equality or you live in this rigid gender role land where nobody has any um, crossover. Women never work or men never change diapers. I don't even know anybody like that. That certainly isn't my life. And I think that's one of the things I think that was the point of the, the woman who emailed, who actually, she went so far as to homeschool and she had a side job. So 
most women today are far more multifaceted than feminists have any clue about. They are able to have children, have some semblance, especially today with technology being the way it is, of having their you know, foot in the um, marketplace in some capacity and still be a wife and mother as opposed to exclusively a wife and mother. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but the reality is that if you, the truth is if you added up the people, the women who were exclusively wives and mothers, the families who have children at home, that is under 18, if you added up the women who are exclusively wives and mothers with the group like myself, who um, works, who's primarily at home, but works on the side, although now I'm an empty nester. So I've upped the ante quite a bit. I've reversed it a little bit, but if you combine those two, most women are doing both to some degree, or they are um, primarily home-based. So they're just, it's just a faux choice to say you either think men and women are equal or you're stuck in this, um, you know, concept that they come up with um, of, of women and men being completely rigid and inflexible with gender roles, which is just flat out not true. So anyway, um, I hope you enjoy the debate. If you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to it. And then hopefully um, this podcast episode here kind of added to that because I know it can be frustrating to try to listen to a debate and it's going well, but I can't refute every single stat that she said and do what I did in the debate. It's very difficult. So I wanted to follow it up with this so that people had a more comprehensive um, takeaway from, from that debate, especially since she made so many statements that were just absolutely false or misleading. So hope that helps. And that's all I got for today. See you next time. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker show. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and to leave us a review as well as share this episode with a friend. As always, you may reach me with any questions or comments at Suzanne at the Suzanne show.com. And if you would like to support this podcast, which would be very much appreciated, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash the Suzanne Venker show. Thanks everyone. Have a good week.